It's Thursday night. Away days is back. The big match preview. I get those goosebumps every time you come around, yeah. You ease my mind, you make everything so fine. Worry about those comments, I'm way too numb, yeah. It's way too dumb, yeah. I get those goosebumps every time. I need the time to throw that to the side, yeah. I get those goosebumps every time, yeah. When you're not around, you throw that to the side, yeah. I get those goosebumps every time, yeah. 713, yeah. Hey, 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 I get those goosebumps every time. I need the hype. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Loaded Mag and UFC. Um, big away days is back. Uh, finally, it's been a while, been a while. But, um, mm-hmm. welcome to everyone in the chat already, and welcome to everyone that is, um, undoubtedly going to be watching this back. But, uh, hope you are all well. And, uh, of course, I've got the main man with me, Mr. Chris Hall. How you doing, fella? Um, how are you? How are you now? How are you in general? But how are you now? You've had a kind of a couple of days, a couple of days, yeah, a couple of days to kind of digest. The, the Everton result? Um, starting with me on a personal note, yeah, I'm absolutely fine, mate. Um, still off, so I'm not back in work on Monday. So it's been, a, it's been a nice couple of days just resting up. Um, in terms of how I'm feeling following the Everton game, yeah, I'm still disappointed, obviously. But, you know, I, we're still, like we discussed uh, on the reaction show uh, on Tuesday night, we're still very much in it. Um, I just hope, I just hope that we can kind of, you know, Really, really, you know, pull our socks up and try and get back to winning ways. I mean, we we had a fantastic win as we saw Pete when we were at St James's against West Ham, three one down. You know, to 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 come back and win that game four three was absolutely fantastic. It does feel like we gave away, um, you know, two points against Everton uh, at St James's on Tuesday night. But I'm still hopeful. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I've got one eye on the uh, Liverpool Sheffield United game tonight because I'm still yeah. hoping that uh, Sheffield United can pinch something off Liverpool so that they drop some points. And also, I'm going to have a keen eye on the Chelsea Man United game as well because obviously that will have an impact on us in our fight for for your for European places. But you know what? As we as we discussed the other night, I think we're still in the mix. Um, and as you, I think it was you, Pete, who rightly pointed out. You know, basically we've got to finish in the top eight. Um, so very, very achievable. I believe that's exactly where we are right now. And I still think we can finish sixth. I really, really do. But we've got to pull back to back wins in front of us. We've got we've got to do it. And it feels like a long, long time since we've done that. So if we can somehow over the next few games win two, three on the bounce, I, I, I think I think Europe's gonna be a, a distinct possibility. How are you anyway, Pete? You all right, mate? All good, all good. Yeah, looking forward to to chatting all things Newcastle United and Fulham. Um, that's for sure. And yeah, um, it, it's interesting actually. I think I think it was November the last time we put back to back Premier League wins together, which tells its own story, really. Um, and so it was, you know, really still disappointing that we didn't get the the three points. We I think. Although people have critiqued our performance in areas, I think we deserved it overall to get the three points. But it was just one one moment of madness um, that actually uh, that, that cost us the points. Um, but look, um, plenty more points to be picked up between now and the end of the season. What eight games to go? A big game on Saturday. But actually, um, first of all, obviously, welcome to everyone in the chat. Loads of questions and comments coming in. Tom was already at it early doors, as he always is, with great questions that we'll ask Emilio. Emilio is on his way, um, so don't worry about that. Um, However, um, what I wanted to ask you, Chris, is obviously the news that's come out today. Um, and, and it does have an effect on Newcastle United, and it was this. We talked about it in our chat. Um, um, Mike Keegan of, of the Mail uh, reported that new, the Premier League are, new, uh, are looking at abolishing um, the sort of the points deduction and in, introducing a new sort of profit and sustainability type rules. 
um, into the Premier League um, and looking at what is called a luxury tax um, for teams that wish to spend a little bit of money. Um, and there's two little snippets from this article that I wanted to um, take out because I want to get your opinion on this, uh, Chris. But um, it says they believe that should clubs wish to have a go um, and have the money to do so, they should not face a punishment um, that could plunge them into the championship. And they also added to that um, a luxury tax has been considered where those clubs who overspend will have a financial punishment, which would increase um, the more they splash the cash. But clubs can choose to press on regardless if they wish and obviously lots of Newcastle fans have likened that to Newcastle United and how it could benefit them but just hearing that news today Chris what were your initial thoughts on the back of that? Uh, I was just very excited if I'm honest um, and it, it, to be fair t- trying to take my Newcastle tinted glasses off it, 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 it kind of makes sense to me if I'm being honest because we can't have another January transfer window like we did um, you know, we 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 pride ourselves here in England of having the you know the the best the best league in the world. We can't have another January transfer window like we did because it's not just Newcastle; it affects it affects all the clubs. Um, and weirdly, I, I I've spoken to many many Everton fans, um, and they they've they've been quite staunch, which I was surprised by. They've been quite staunch, saying, you know, clubs should be able the the, the fans I've spoken to anyway. He said that clubs should be able to spend whatever money that they want, yeah. and you know. Fans, when you get your big takeover, when you get your big uh, moments, your golden ticket, if you like, from um, from uh, Willy Wonka, if you get your golden ticket, you should be able to spend money that you know your owners have. Um, I know some people will say it's not fair. Some people will say that you know it kind of makes a mockery of football and it gets a bit ridiculous. But over the years, that's what's happened anyway. And if we look at Chelsea as an example, it's no guarantee of success. Um, but it just means that it gives all clubs an opportunity. Um, I actually think as well, you know, as I say, it, it does it does help um, our situation, given that we do have the richest owners in world football. But I, I do think, obviously, we'd see an increase in spend, but I don't think we'd go silly, silly. And I, I don't think you'd see Newcastle making, you know, £750 million signings or anything like that. It just wouldn't happen like that. Yeah. But to be able to just release release the gates a little bit and just allow, you know, for us to go out and buy three or four, five, 50 million plus pound players. I don't, I don't really see the big issue with that. I know it's maybe it's easy for me to say, as I say, with my Newcastle tinted glasses on, but you know, any owners who come in and want to buy a football club, they want to progress the club. What they don't want is, you know, teams like Luton, teams like Forest, if they've, if they've, you know, if they're under these current restrictions, these PSR or FFP restrictions, they're never going to get up the top. It's never going to happen. So they need to do something. And I think having this tax, this luxury tax that they talk about, for me, I think it makes sense because one, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a nod to the fact that people are spending too much money, and um, so that that is a good thing. And then you know, the clubs can be penalised for it. And the clubs that stay within the structure and the clubs that stay within the limits. You know they they will they will benefit from that and they will they will receive a, a sum from what I've heard, um, and like I say, it doesn't guarantee success. Money does not guarantee success. But if you've got new if you've got owners who want to invest in a football club that they've bought, they should be entitled to do so, in my opinion. And I, I, and I think that goes across the board. I think most most uh, clubs you know would accept that. There'll be some clubs who say that that's you know that shouldn't be the case, and chances are that would probably be the top six who would say that because they're kind of protected. But certainly, uh, that certainly from from my perspective, from a club who is outside of the current big six, I, th- I think it's good for football and it's good for the league. And I think that's why they're looking into it because, like I say, we cannot have another transfer window like we had in January because players will not come to the Premier League and we won't be able to see you know the fantastic collection of players that we've seen over the years and why people want to come to the Premier League because it's so competitive. Yeah. What about you, Pete? What are your thoughts on it? Um, naturally, um, I was really happy to hear these rules because these are the kind of rules that have been um, have been kind of branded about for for a long time now. You know, this is how the Premier League should operate. This is how we uh, owners with money, as you mentioned, should be allowed to spend that money. And I, and I understand it that the the rules 
almost came into effect many years ago off the back of one or two clubs in the lower divisions, in the lower leagues, struggling and not being able to afford um, to run their clubs properly or going in all gung-ho and then having a massive bill and tax to pay that they couldn't afford and then the club just went flat off the back of it. I get that. But there are other Premier League clubs or clubs out there that have rich owners that if push comes to the shove, they can facilitate that that support to the club if it needs it. Um, our club is a perfect example of that. We're, we're arguably the richest, the, we have arguably the richest owners, okay, uh, of all the world. If you want, if they wanted to put their money on the table, we've seen in other investments outside of football that they've just gone and splashed like like that. They have the money there, but we're not allowed to spend it, and they would want to spend it if they were allowed to. So hearing that noise um, and the rumours today w- w- was great. And the thing that excited me as well is that there's there there is talk that it could well be kind of signed off and and agreed as early as June in the June meeting at the end of the season. Um, whether that would mean it would be in place by the summer or not, I don't know. But but it, it would fill me with hope if that was the case. Because you look at Newcastle United and you're looking at where lots of people have said we're in a bit of a crossroads, you know, not being able to spend the money that we want to, all the rest of it, talking about players leaving, the Isaacs and the Brunos and all the rest of that. This allows us to really kind of put a rocket up the club and go, right, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's go and spend the money. And let's not do a Chelsea. Let, let's be clear on that. Let's not do a Chelsea where you're spending a, a billion pounds and you're literally ripping up your whole squad and, and buying a new squad effectively. Not yeah. doing that, but being able to go out and, and attract the very best, be able to provide bigger wages, be able to provide a bigger transfer fee and get those maybe three, four, five quality players that's really going to put us in a conversation for Champions League football next season. Like and that would allow us to do that, and that excites me. But uh, understandably, there's one or two that are a little bit unsure about that. And David Cook dropped um, uh, a message into my my tweet earlier and put it in the chat here as well. I was going to say that, yeah. Um, and I and I get it. I get it. You know, understand various uh, people getting excited. Um, but the UEFA rules would prevent us from playing in Europe. And yeah, there is still that seventy percent um needed. Uh, in order to be able to qualify and play for European competitions. And I understand that. Um, But we don't know how that would affect us. Um, I I imagine it would affect every single club because every single club would want to spend more. Would it then affect every single club with with regards to that 70%? Is that a conversation Mm. that the Premier League would go and have with UEFA off the back of this? Because... Let's let's be honest, Premier League want to be the best in the world, the best league in the world. And they are mm-hmm. going to want to facilitate something with UEFA to make that happen. Or are there other things that could be worked around? Nobody knows yet. It hasn't been signed off. But is there optimism and reason to be um, even a little bit excited? Yes, definitely. Because even in the short term, it would allow Newcastle United to build as a Premier League club. We'd be able mm-hmm. to buy or spend more than what we're able to at the moment. So even if it took us up another 5, 10, 15, 20%, that's still progress and it still allows us to build. Let's not forget, you know, you've got the seller kicking in, you've got the Adidas kicking in this summer, you've got other sponsorships that we've been um, building up over time. like Champions League money. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right in the mix. We're right in the mix yeah. of being able to spend money and we're in the new three-year rolling period starting July the 1st. So... You know, it's not like we're we're paupers here. It doesn't mean that we've not got any money to spend at all. We have, but we know we've got far more money to be able to spend than most of the clubs, and we'd like to be able to utilize that. So let's wait and see. Obviously, the way for uh, conversation is important, um, and of course, that they're the competitions we want to be playing in. So we're going to mm-hmm. have to toe the line for that. But look, I'm I'm looking at Newcastle United off the pitch. I was asked the question the other day, um, you know, how would you rate Newcastle United off the pitch in terms of revenues and building um, building the, the blocks of, of getting investment in? And I think they've been doing a great job. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the ticketing and all the rest of it aside is a different conversation. But what I mean is, is that they're building this club financially off of the pitch so that we can be competitive on it uh, long term, even within these current rules. It's going to take us longer. But this mm-hmm. bringing in today and seeing this conversation pop up, this can only mean that we get to where we want to get to sooner. And that can only be for me a good thing for Newcastle United. But um... just to just to add in, Pete, I think what David's saying as well, and David, I could be wrong here, and Pete, tell me if I am. But um, I think the UEFA rules came in after the first proposal, and I think the one that's come out today is like it kind of supersedes that. So for me, and Pete's already kind of alluded to it, I think there would be a way around it if if they were to do this new model, this new NBA model. Um, I for me, I think there would probably be a tax if you've overspent, which, as we know, would go to the clubs who've already. Um, it, it would go to the clubs who who are staying in the limit, and then obviously filter down to the EFL grassroots, etc. But it wouldn't surprise me if UEFA then said, "Oh, you know, if you, if you've broken the rules as well, you need to pay. You need to pay a luxury tax to play in Europe as well." I, for me, that's how I see it happen. I think if if you break the rules, there's probably well, I say break the rules. If you go over the limit, I think there's probably a a fine or a tax that you would pay in order to you know kind of satisfy the Premier League. And then I think it would be the same in Europe as well. I don't think it would just be a case of shut the door, you're not playing in Europe, because if that's the case, you could find that three, four, five of the teams in the Premier League would not be playing in Europe, and then the European competition would be, you know, it would be a bit ridiculous from a, from an English uh, representative point of view. Um, because let's not let's not beat around the bush here. If this comes into play, I don't think it will be just Newcastle who kind of go over their limits. And you know there'll be other clubs as well who will who will equally go over their limits. I think there'll be I think there'll be a lot of spend. And Pete's rightly said there as well the start of the new three year cycle. Um, so clubs we've seen in the first year of the three year cycle where clubs kind of overspend and then try and claw the money back over the remaining two years. So we could well see that as well. So I think I think I think the scope and I think it's open to interpretation. But at the moment we're just guessing, aren't we? But I'm sure that there will be a workaround for that, in my opinion, anyway. There would have to be. Uh, some people are put in the chat, you know, you, uh, are UEFA not going to want Premier League clubs to be part of their competition? Well, of course they are. Uh, we're, we're one of the most attractive set of uh, teams out there. Um, so they're going to want us representing um, Europe in, in European competition. So they, they, would, they would have to find a way. That is for sure. Oh, yeah, fighter. Uh, we have an update. Um, yep, yeah, Chelsea won, Man United nil um mm. be interesting to see what people want in the chat actually results I know. um and I, I know we've talked about it before what, what do we actually um what do we actually want in terms of results but just on this psr uh d- discussion let's bring in the main man um uh from cottage talk let's bring in uh, emilio in the house how you doing emilio hello guys hello pete hello chris thanks hello, for being back on. Seems, seems only like yesterday End of November, I think, when we lost. Yeah, or oh, no, middle of this. It was early December when we lost three 0 at the uh, at your ground when him and their stupid league got sent off in that game. Um, but yeah, yeah, we were talking. You, you had, you know, so many injuries that time. I remember probably still got the same issues now, to be honest. But yeah, I was disappointed after that three 0 defeat. And the cup game probably came at the wrong time for us after we got knocked out by Liverpool in the semi final of the League Cup. But yeah, good to be back on and yeah, good to talk about Fulham Newcastle. And we owe you a. A defeat. We need to beat you. It's long overdue, to be honest with you. It's a long time, really long time coming. <coughs> really interesting chat because uh, you're saying that it's long overdue a win against us. But <laughs> every time we're in a bad run, we seem to play you and always pick up a result. So yeah, we yeah, always play full and when teams are playing bad. We'll always give you wins, always give you points, always. We don't really think that's us. We don't really give teams results, but they need one, like we did with Everton on Tuesday night. Yeah. But, uh, I just want to get your thoughts just before we get into the game and talk about it. But we've just been talking the PSR, um, mm. and I don't know what, how much of the conversation you caught. But um, Mike Keegan of the um, Mail Sport, you know, just just a little recap: looking at abolishing the points deduction, bringing in an NBA style luxury tax. Uh, of, of sort, which mm. effectively means, you know, that if teams want to have a go and spend a little bit more money, that they can. Um, and uh, this luxury tax mm. 
is that you know um they, they would get a form of a fine a financial fine uh which we've just been talking about will be filtered down within the clubs that do stick into that um psr sort of limit mm-hmm. uh, what are your as a fulham fan what are your thoughts with that news is that is that positive news for you is it is it negative like how are you seeing that if it was to potentially come in yeah i look at it from two angles again sort of not i'm saying sitting on the fence but the first, if you look at it from a positive then these owners are for the you know, so-called big six and they've got billions to spend why why can't they spend it you know i know the gap between the top six and the rest of the league and below that will tend to widen which then may mean does a european super league may may bring that closer to the table but it means some of those penalty fines are distributed to lower division clubs and to you know, championship and lower division that's good for football as a neutral. You know, I think it may, it may mean that Fulham's could compete more competitive, like the likes of Brighton, top eight teams and below. It means that, that but you, I see this then becoming a two tier league. You've got all the top teams dominating the league. Typically, and you've mentioned it, Pete, money doesn't guarantee success. Look at Chelsea. You know, at the moment, they're a good example. So it's, you know, you, Newcastle, I've got the richest owners in the world, but you've got to spend it wisely. And maybe we'll talk about your manager after this. I remember asking you a question a few months ago whether, He's still the right man for the job. I'd like to get your views now, four months down the line, but we'll talk about that afterwards. But it's money doesn't give it doesn't guarantee success. But if the owners want to spend the money in, in smaller clubs like Fulham and Forest and Brighton and Palace benefit from that as well as championship and first division, that's not a bad thing for football. At the same time, I think football then become boring. You're gonna see a Man City Arsenal nil nil draw every bloody week. Do you really want to see that? You know, to be honest with you, if it's gonna be Liverpool are going to smash Sheffield United one week, but then struggle to beat their, their rivals top six and play a ball nil nil draw. So I think neutrals want to see a competitive league. They want to see teams competing against each other. You want to see the unpredictability of the league, like Luton, you know, def- defying all the all their critics. Yeah. But I, I, you see both sides of the coin. You, it means yeah. smaller clubs, less wealthy clubs, become maybe more competitive and closely aligned, and and smaller clubs get more distribution of funds. Flip side, if you want to, see, neutrals want to see a good Premier League, twenty you know, twenty teams competing against each other. It's going to be m- more interesting the way it is at the moment, and you know, you get you you have to play within your thresholds and tolerances. So yeah, it depends which side of the fence you're at. But if I was a wealthy owner, I don't want to be playing Man City and Liverpool every week and then smashing Sheffield United, Luton. That's boring, and you, a fan doesn't want to see that. I don't think you'd want to see that week in week out. You know, surely no. you want you want to be. You want football to be enjoyable, fun. It hits our hearts, hits our minds. But if it's got, if it becomes predictable, why would we want to watch it? You know, that's just that's my view anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. Want a more competitive game? You you want a more competitive league? You want the opportunity to see other teams being competitive and and have good seasons and be <clears> there. Look <throat> at yourselves last season fighting out for Europe. We were fighting out for the Champions League. Villa are now doing that this season. You know, you got. Um, you know, you got West Ham, Brighton, Newcastle all fighting out with with mm. the likes of Chelsea and various others for European football this season. So mm. it, it's bringing in different teams yeah. um, to the to the conversation, but we want more of that. So, so I I, I agree. I, I understand um, diversity. You want to see a bit of variety of football, and if the Premier League are trying to attract global investors, global interest, mm. you know, all these all these Saudi, you know. Fans will will obviously support the clubs that are successful, you know, the big six. But what's making the Premier League the success it is? It's not the Man City nil nils against Arsenal. It's Luton fighting for their lives. You know, for the unpredictability, points deductions, the Forest staying up, the Everton going down. What the hell's going on? Burnley, one minute they're out of out of it, they're getting relegated. Now they're in a fighting chance of staying up. So it's will we get that predictability with the change in rules? Probably not, but it's. Well, I see it becomes a two-tier league. It will eventually get that to that point. I think it's inevitable they will get to that at some point in our lives. Well, definitely. Look, we'll, we'll get on to football talk um, about our own clubs. And, of course, um, not great results for us this week um, <laughs> for our respective clubs. Obviously, we've just touched on the disappointing uh, result for us, kind of chucking two points away from a really sort of Silly, mm. silly mistake by 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 Paul Dummett. But of course, from your perspective, for me, a surprising result. Mm. Um, Forest um, beating you guys three um, one, and um, you know it was 
highlighted pretty much by that 33 minute um triple sub that was made um by Marco Silva and um you know uh Awobi Wilson and I think is it Luke Lukic? Yeah, Lukic, yeah. Yeah, or were all subbed off on the 33rd minute. Um and and obviously look pretty embarrassed doing so. I've seen the video back. They mm. they, look, they look really embarrassed being mm. dragged off. But look, ju just your thoughts on that. Just touch on that for us. Um, you know how bad a result was that, and 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 did the thirty three minute substitution? Uh, do you think it's going to hold any significance in terms of how it mm. comes into this weekend? No, good question. Um, yeah, I was watching the game on on Tuesday. First twenty five minutes, we were a shambles. To be honest with you, it was embarrassing to say the least. But Give Forest credit. You know, there's obviously, I'm sure there'll be some Forest fans maybe listening to us. You know, D our friend Dave on the, on the 12th Man podcast, you know, we was exchanging a number of messages back and forth. You know, and to be honest, I hate to admit it, I actually predicted we'd lose 3 1. And I was right. And I was right. So Steve Reynolds is watching can, can vouch for that. I did predict. We're very unpredictable. And if you look at our record, New, Newcastle and Fulham have got a very similar record this season, winning as many games as they've lost and met few draws. And I think that's. The reason why we're, you know, we're so, you could argue Newcastle are underperforming and Fulham, we could we could have another five to ten points more than we should have. And every every place in the Premier League is what another two million pounds in the coffers if we uh, push up that table. But yeah, I, I was a surprise. New, Forest had to fight for their lives. We're safe, little to play for. Tuesday night, you know, it's, it's got a recipe for disaster. And Marco Silva's tactics, I think you got it slightly wrong on on Tuesday night. But, you know, we haven't got the squad to play two, three games in a week. And that's the bottom line. I know we've, we've got a few injuries. I mean, we had a bad spell where we had a lot of injuries around Christmas time. We've come off the back of that. But our squad is ageing. You know, the fact that we're mid-table, semi-final of a cup, I think that's a good season for us. So, Forest had more to fight for. They felt this was a game they can get points. And they 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 they, they, were, they hit us right from the off in fair play. They got an early goal, got a second. And to be honest with you, if it went to 2-0 at half time, I thought we would have got, I think we would have got something out of the game. You know, from the half hour, we were dominant. We were, the possession rates, I think at the end of the game, was 75% in our favour. The difference was Forrest defended for their lives. Fulham gave away sloppy goals and got punished. So I'm not taking anything away from Forrest. They deserved the win. But, you know, I did see the trouble substitution was a little bit, <laughs> you know, last time I remember seeing something similar was at Craven College years ago when Mourinho was a Chelsea manager. And Fulham were leading one nil, and about, I think he took he changed three plays off about twenty minutes, twenty two minutes. Joe Cole was it? Joe Cole? I can't remember. The three other three plays got substituted. It reminded me of that scenario, and I think three was a little bit rash. I would have just met two would have been sensible, but the fact that he didn't make any defensive changes, he changed the middle of the pitch and changed the wide plays, which I thought was a little bit um, bullish. It yeah. sort of, you know, if it wasn't for that goal at half time then I think we would have got something out of the game. What it does to the mental confidence of these guys, morale, I think it'd be fine. He would have had a gentle word and there is at the end of the game. They weren't at fault per se. We were, we were lax in the middle of the park. Forrest took us by surprise. Pitch was slippery. We made mistakes, got punished. Um, I think Marco Silva will just say, look, move on. And we've got you guys on Saturday, another another big game, three points. We win on Saturday when... We're knocking on the door behind you, about two, three points behind. So it's all to fight for. So it's a, it's not a. I think this game is key because I think there's, there is something to play for. Forest, you could argue less so. Forest wanted it more midweek game, but this is Saturday, three o'clock kickoff. We've got traditionally a good home form this year, so you know the, it will be a, hopefully a different proposition to last season's demolition at the cottage and the three 0 defeat at St James's in December. Yeah, well, I, I, I like last year. I like I like last year's result. <laughs> no, I, I, not... <laughs> we should have that again. But... <laughs> oh, no, no, thank you. We we mustn't concede early. That's the key thing. We've got to we've got to get in front. I think you know our record from behind isn't particularly great over the over the years, and that's well documented. But similarly, when we go ahead, we don't lose many games either. So it's a uh, mm. it's going to be an interesting tussle, shall we say? I think home advantage. I'd like to think will will benefit us, but we'll see. I want to get Chris's thoughts in just a second on on Fulham just in general, but uh, I, I wanted to bring the, the the league table up because as you mentioned, you weren't you going into last weekend, um, you were only a couple of points behind, and it looked like <coughs> the, the 
fight for Europe had, had been condensed by a number of teams fighting it out. Um, obviously, you're still not too far away from us now. Like you say, we're, you, you're, you're, what, five points behind? Brings you within two with, with a win on, on, on Saturday, albeit a game in hand. Um, do, you, do you genuinely see yourself in, in, the, in the running for European football? Or do you think that's maybe just a, um, a reach too far? Definitely a reach too far. There's a lot of pre, you know, the uh, European, uh, the, the break for the international matches. There's a big, big contingent of Fulham fans were hoping and hopeful. You know, I was, at the end of the day, it's, I'm more realistic. I said, yeah, it would be nice, but we haven't got the squad. You know, we need to make some investments in the summer. FFP rules are going to restrict us on how much we can invest. So again, you know, for me, it's Premier League survival is always key. You know, I want to be I want to be playing in this division. I want to be able to give the top six teams a run for their money like we've done this season. So we've closed that gap here from this year compared to last year. We've got to a semi-final of a cup. So I think it was nonsensical for a lot of the fans, from the fans to believe that Europe was a reality. If you look at the table, it's it potentially possible, but yeah. not the priority. The priority is play, enjoy your football. You know, you know, we've got Man City still to play at home. We've got Liverpool at home. So we've got, you know, those big games that could determine who's going to win in, in the Premier League this year. So I wasn't on that bandwagon. Many people watching tonight and Fulham fans will probably were on that bandwagon. I was very much, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And then the fact that we've been, what's sort of put back down into touch with the last two games where we should have got more points than we have, then I think that makes the reality. You know, Fulham, and we haven't got the squad to play in Europe and we just need to push on and build for next season. Definitely, yeah, Chris. You know what? Uh, looking at that table now, if that result against well Chelsea against Man United stays as it is, and we get a win at the weekend, we're a point behind Man United. It's a really tough one. Where I'm like, I'm conflicted now of what I, what result I want. I was adamant I wanted a draw before, but I'm not quite sure now. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to get what other people think about that. Seeing, seeing the table as it is now, a win, hopefully, at Craven Cottage on Saturday yeah. brings us right to the table yeah. for sixth place competition. It's an interesting one. But um, go on, go on. And, and, and on what I want as well, your thoughts on that, but also your thoughts on Fulham this season and any players that have kind of stood out for you from what you've seen there? Yeah. I mean, just to touch on the league. Um, yeah, no, to be honest, Pete, oh, yeah, it's 2 0 Chelsea for scored a penalty. Jeez. Yeah, Jeez. 2-0. Yeah, it's for Lisa, Lisa put in the chat that Chelsea has a penalty and it looks like they've scored it because Lisa, <laughs> Lisa said that it's 2-0 <laughs> Chelsea against Man United. I mean, do you know what, Pete? This is why this is why we asked the question and I think we spoke about it on the last show as well. And I totally got why you wanted Man United to... Uh, well, you wanted a draw, really, didn't you? In an ideal world, draw is probably the safest result. But then mm. in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, I know, I know a win would bring Chelsea closer to us, but Chelsea don't really worry me too much because they're so inconsistent. And for us to have the opportunity to catch Man United, who I think are more than capable of putting a run of results together, I think I'd rather us be a little bit closer to Man United because I do expect Chelsea to just drop off. I mean, for example, Chelsea have got um, Chelsea have got Everton at home coming up in the next few weeks. And I've said to me blue mates, I said, it wouldn't surprise me if you went and got a result at Stamford Bridge because Chelsea are just so hit and miss. You know, they can do what they've done tonight. But then they can go. They'll go and play Palace or Everton or Bournemouth, and they'll they'll draw or lose. That's just the way that they've been playing this season. Whereas with Man United, I think they've I think Man United are more than capable of putting those one of the results together. So for me, I'm actually quite happy with this score as it stands um, because I think I think if it gets us closer to Man United, I'm I'm more than happy with that. In terms of Fulham, I mean I'm I'm a big fan of um, Palinia. Palinia is an absolutely fantastic player. It looked like didn't it, Emilio? You were going to lose him to Bayern mm. Munich. But the, the deal fell through. Uh, but I'll tell you who's, who's impressed me most this season uh, from what I've seen. It's uh, Munez, the, the striker. Mm -hmm. um, I've put him in my fancy fussy team, Emilio. Uh, and he's, he's, not, he's not been letting me down. He's not been letting me down. He's very, very cheap. And uh, he seems to be like, you know, the front man. And am I right in thinking, Emilio, he's actually keeping Brozier off the team at the moment? Is that right? Um, Broge has got an, in slight, an injury again. It's speculative whether he has been on the bench the last couple of games, but uh, yeah, but up, and, up until Broge was on the bench, yeah, he's been keeping him out, you know. So it's a uh, fair play, fair play to him. I wrote him off three, four months ago, not good enough. You know, we had you know, our Vinicius uh, Moonies were our two forwards. It's just where are the goal's going to come from, you know, we're all, we're all slagging him off, but he's found a rich vein of form, you know, first goal opens up that little that confidence and you've got a good manager there who's getting the best out of him and 
And as however I say, he's he's supported him throughout his career at Fulham. You know, he felt that maybe he needed to go out to loan at a couple of clubs. Didn't really perform particularly well, but he persevered. Sometimes he was risk, he had he was he had no choice. He was the only forward available, so he had no choice but the playing. But you could see he was developing, getting more confidence, holding up the ball well, and suddenly just takes one goal, you know, then another goal, a bit of in you know getting man of the matches all of that it breeds confidence and you've got a manager there who believes in him and and he's believed in him from day one and that's a key thing and then now he's given him the chance to play week in week out and now he's a he's a regular starter so fingers crossed he can continue with this rich vein of form but i still think we need another striker i'm not sure yeah. how how you know can he do this year on year out but let's see so far he's proved everyone wrong including myself put it that way yeah Fantastic bicycle kick. I saw his bicycle kick the other day. Really, Lovely. really, really smart finish. Yeah, yeah, very really good. Yeah, three months yeah. ago, he would have hit it over the stadium. That was a, that's a yeah. difference. And what just what the technique was very good, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously there's a couple of other players, you know, who, who are always, always a threat with Fulham. Um, you know, one one player that I want to touch on, if you don't mind, and his, his name, and Pete, sorry if I'm jumping the gun here, but his name has been linked with Newcastle yet again. Yeah. Um, and that's Tosin Adrabayo. Mm -hmm. um, he's out of contract at the end of the season. Uh, I believe, Emilio, tell me if I'm wrong, he's a right-sided centre-back, uh, which yeah. is exactly what we're looking for at the moment. I mean, what? How, what's your, you know, how would you rate Tosin Adrabayo? And do you think he's, you know, a player who's destined for bigger things? Or do you think that maybe, you know, a move to Newcastle is maybe a bit too soon and maybe he should be looking for more of a sideways move? Or... Do you think that you might actually sign him up to a new deal? Um, I know we've put a, a bigger off on big offer on the table, which which hasn't been accepted yet. But uh, I'm a little bit mixed with him. You know, I'm always of the opinion if you don't want to play for the club, you shouldn't be starting on the pitch. As far as I'm yeah. concerned, you, you refuse yeah, yeah. to sign a contract, yeah. out you go. Basically, we pay your wages. You should be professional. So, but give him his juice. He's come in, done a pretty de decent job. <laughs> He's done a pre a decent job um, since he's come in. The last couple of games, he's been a little bit suspect. I think he's been a little bit sluggish. But his body language suggests he's very, very neutral. I don't see enough full of manager. I don't see him kissing a badge. He scored a goal, consolation goal on Tuesday night. OK, when you're 3-1 down, you just, you just want to get back to start the game and you're not going to necessarily celebrate per se. But I don't see enough emotions there. And to me, it suggests he's not going to, want to, he's not going to be here next season. Will he be a good uplift for Newcastle? Potentially. I think, is he, does he think he's better than he actually is? Yes. I don't think he's as that big player. He's an important player for us. But, you know, if you, I'm always of the opinion, if you're not committing, you don't want to play for the club, you don't want to sign up along the way, you shouldn't be on the starting eleven. That's yeah. my gut feel. You know, yeah. we've got other players, that, you know, got Diop, who I think is a competent defender, in on the, who very similar to Tosin. Some games Tosin's very good. His distribution is good. He's, he's a threat from set pieces. But, mm. you know, he's, he's hit and miss at the moment. And, you know, all these fans were raving about him barely two or three games ago. Now, after seeing him in the last two performances, they've got a different opinion. So, yeah, he's a bit up and down, a bit like Fulham, to be honest with you. But he's got potential to push on. But, you know, I, I don't think he's as, as big a player as, as he thinks he is, to be honest with you. If, if he had, say, and this is just hindsight, obviously, but... Or, um devil's advocate as a, as we like to call mm. it emilio but say say he had four years left on his contract and someone came in for him how much how much would you want for him realistically if you if you were you know if if you were to let him go and he had four years left on his contract how much would would, would you be looking at for someone like Tosin another like you've got to look about 30 ish million to be honest he's got the ages on his side is he's he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's he's early mid-20s got potential upside still there i think if he plays week in week out and he's focused and signs a long-term deal then we might see more consistency in performances. I know Steve Reynolds is on here saying you can have him. It's uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about. He's, he's on the same opinion as me that if you're not committed to the club, you shouldn't be starting week in week out. Fabio Cavallo was another example two years ago when yeah. he did, clearly did want to sign a contract. I, I'm of opinion. Look, you don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to play for the club. You know, I don't want you in a starting eleven. And he got Liverpool came and paid a re, you know a minimal fee because he was out of contract. He got loaned out, farmed out. Now he's playing a whole city and being overweight. And Fulham fans want him back. I want him nowhere near the Craven Cottage. That's history. Harvey Elliott's the same example. You know what? He, he wanted to leave Fulham to go to Liverpool. He can stay there. I don't want him anywhere near the club. I can't stand the fella. So um, it's so for me, 30 million, Chris, is probably 30 ish million. I think he'd be well yeah. at. Yeah. The okay. other player you've not mentioned who I think 
doesn't get enough credit for it is Anthony Robinson, left back. He's probably mm. one of my top two players of the season. He's been outstanding. Mm. And I know, Russ, you're watching this. American through and through. Andy Robinson doesn't get enough credit. He's one of those players that Fulham fans like to criticise when things go wrong, but doesn't get enough credit when things go well. He's been outstanding. He's got pace. He's got he's the right age, an international for his country. He's a player I worry that we're going to lose this season. Yeah, I agree with you, Foxy. I think Paulinho, I believe, if, if Silva stays, Paulinho will stay at Fulham next season. He will mm. not go to Bayern Munich. You know, I think he's 29 years old in July. His time was last year. He missed that boat for various yeah. reasons. He'd be best position to say where he is. Andy Robinson is a player I will think will be most impactful to Fulham if he leaves. Trying to replace him as a left back is going to be a big, big loss. Fulham fans don't appreciate him as far as I'm concerned. He's a very important player for us and he's he's matured and grown this season. I think we're going to struggle to keep him. Mm. Just just on Anthony, on Anthony Robinson, because we've got some Newcastle fans that in the past when he's been linked with us have kind of said he's he's not not great, he's not not been a good player. Like for this season in particular, obviously we know he's got bags of pace, like we've seen it when he's played mm. against us. But what else within the within his game makes him kind of stand out? Um he's improving defensively. I think there's you know, you know, you look at many of the mistakes that have been made this season, not many have come from the left side. I think he's 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 obviously, like you said, he's got the pace that benefits, uh, you know, gives him a lot of, you know, plus points there. He gets forward a lot. His link up play with William, him and William on the left hand side. William will probably start on Saturday, so him and and William linking up on the left hand side is a threat to any 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 squad that we play. Um, I just think his link up play is very good. He's, if he could just improve his distribution from set, you know, when he gets into good position, sometimes his final ball could be better. His crossing could be better, but. He's improved defensively, which is where there was a, there was a few question marks in the last couple of years. He just needs to improve that distribution, that final ball, you know, when he's going to good positions. And then I think he will. Uh... <laughs> no, thank you, David. No, thank what, you. What deal? <laughs> Swap deals on, <laughs> Emilio. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Andy Robinson's just going. to Liverpool are linked with him. I think we will we will struggle to hold on to him. To be honest with you, mm, one to watch. One mm, to watch. Yeah. That is for sure. And just a real quick word on this. I don't know how true this is um, before we move on to the next section. Um, links here, albeit from not necessarily a reliable source, but I've seen other sources touch on this as well um, about Marco Silva's position at the club. You, you mentioned just a minute ago, if Marco Silva stays, you think Paulini will stay. Teams like West Ham and one or two others are on alert with regards to his release clause. Uh, of Marco Silva. Uh, what are the chances of him, in your opinion, leaving the club? He was very close to in the summer and he didn't. Mm. Is is that going to be the same kind of mm. story again this summer? Um, you know, he signed a long-term deal, what was it, in, earlier in the season, which was surprised everybody because he wasn't committing longer term. He, wa he, he wasn't getting the financial backing from the owners. And maybe in hindsight, you know, we, we can blame the owners that they're not doing enough for the club, but FFP rules, you see, look at these other clubs, um, you know, in, you know, overspending, getting getting punished. You know, Leicester City are going to get a fine or get a points deduction next season if they get promoted already. So it's, you know, I don't blame the owners that they haven't invested enough in the club because they're probably trying to stay within these boundaries of FFP. But, you know, Silver's critical to Fulham's success. I think he's still, he's still got to push the, to the next level. And I think he, if he's given a bit of backing in the summer, he will say he signed a four or five year extension. There's a there's a big release clause supposedly in this in the article that was in the Sun earlier today. But no disrespect to West Ham, why would he go to West Ham? No, I'm saying the gap between Fulham and West Ham is closing now. We're what five points behind them now. Yeah. Lawless, I hope you're not watching Lawless. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, bad grade, bad grade. The gap's closing, and you know, we've still got to go to we've still got to go to their stadium in a couple of weeks' time. And if we can get something out of that game, again, it's. It's close between Newcastle, West Ham, Fulham, Brighton, Chelsea. There's a there's only a handful of points there to to play against. But Marco Silva is important to Fulham, and the fact that he signed a long term deal, I think he believes in this in this um this opportunity and this journey for the club. So I think he's got at least another season in him, unless you know will West Ham come in for him? They might make a cheeky offer, but I think he'd be, he's he could do better than West Ham. No disrespect to West Ham fans, it's not a big big enough jump for him. Oh yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, Gladlaws is not on here. He'd be kicking up <laughs> right now. He'd be going into one of his rants uh, about West Ham and being a top club and all the rest of it. But look, we'll leave it there. Right, we'll get into the match now. We're going to get into the match and, and talk about the game. I want to get your starting eleven as well, uh, Emilio. Uh, before we kind of finish up with some questions and predictions to begin with. But um, of course, as always, um, when we look in the look at the game in a bit more detail, of course, we've got to start with mm. this. Good evening, lads. Good evening. Good evening. Like magic, he appears and he's back. Welcome back, Keith. Uh, it's been a while. Um, not been a while since we saw you, but it's been a while since you've been on uh, away days. But um, how are you this week, mate? How's things? Yeah, all good, thanks. Uh, it has been a long time since uh, I've been on away days, so I've got loads of stats. I hope you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, look, what have you got for us this week? Fulham, Craven Cottage, had a, had a good run there in recent years, you know, um, going back and even this season playing against them um, in the FA Cup. But, but what stats you got for us this time, mate? Absolutely. Um, got loads of head to head stats here. Got some stats on the managers and the goalkeepers, a few on the players, and some general stats to round off. Newcastle's all-time record in this fixture. Played 59 games, um, 23 wins, 11 draws, and surprisingly 25 defeats. So a slight edge to Fulham, although there isn't much in it. Um, Head-to-head -head in the Premier League, um, Newcastle have got the edge slightly on this one. 30 games, 14 wins for Newcastle, 12 win wins for Fulham, and five draws in this fixture. At Craven Cottage, uh, Fulham have got 21 wins, Newcastle have got 12 wins, and there's been five draws in this fixture. Um, Newcastle have scored more goals, uh, 44 goals compared to Fulham's 35 goals. And uh, Newcastle have also got the better defensive record in this fixture, 11 clean sheets compared to six clean sheets for Fulham. How do the managers match up? Well, Eddie Howe, his record as manager in games against Fulham, he's managed eight games and won seven and lost just once. And Mark Marco Silva, he's won just one game, he's drawn one and he's lost five games. He's managed against Newcastle. The goalkeepers, Bernd Leno, um, He's kept eight clean sheets in 29 matches this season in the Premier League this season. Um, Fulham have been conceding a goal every 67 minutes. And so Leno's sort of average per 90 minutes. His conceded stat is 1.34 goals um, every 90 minutes. Whereas Martin Dubravka, he's kept three clean sheets. Chris is waving his hands there. Sheffield United have equalised. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, what Keith. Mean, what Sorry, Keith. That that, that's crucial news in what could be a crucial, decisive moment in the Premier League this season. 60 minutes gone. 60 minutes gone. Wow. Ooh. Come on, boys. Come on, boys. Come on, Come on them blades. Come on, Chef You. Come on, uh, Christy those, Wilder. You know, those, makes sense. Those, those fans of the cop will be sucking that ball in the back of the net. You know what they like, Chris. <laughs> Um, we'll see how long it lasts, uh. yeah. Sorry, Keith, carry on, mate. Carry no, on, no problem. Martin Dubravka, he's uh, kept three clean sheets in 15 matches in the Premier League this season for Newcastle. Newcastle have been conceding a goal every 41 minutes, though, so not been uh, conceding more in a shorter time scale than uh, Fulham. Dubravka, uh, every 90 minutes, his goals conceded stat is 2.2 uh, goals conceded every 90 minutes compared to Bernd Leno's 1.34 every 90 minutes. Moving on to some players here, some positive news on players here. 
Alexander Isak, the man of the moment. He's uh, scored in each of his past five Premier League home games for Newcastle. Um, only Alan Shearer with 15, Andy Cole with um, eight, Les Ferdinand with six have scored more consecutive games in the uh, competition than for Newcastle at St. James's Park. And Alexander Isak, he's scored his 25th Premier League goal. Um, only Seb Larson with 26 and Freddie Jungberg with 48 have scored more in the competition among Swedish players. So he's in really good company there when you consider some of the Swedish players that have played in um, the Premier League. Harvey Barnes, he's been directly involved in three goals in the last two games. Uh, two goals and one assist in his past two Premier League games. Um, and that was as many as his first 11 games in the uh, Premier League for Newcastle. Um, <laughs> well, he also has um, six uh, goal involvements for Newcastle coming at St. James's Park. Um, for Fulham, Andreas Pereira, um, he has seven assists from uh, dead ball situations um, since um, the uh, start of last season in, in the Premier League for Fulham. And only James Ward-Prowse has um, had more during this time. So, um, certainly one to watch out for at the weekend, Andreas Pereira. And Rodrigo Munez um, is Fulham's top goal scorer this season with eight goals in 24 games. Um, some general stats to round off. Um, Newcastle have scored um, 13 Premier League goals um, via substitutes this season. And that's more than any other side, uh, side in the Premier League. Um and um, Fulham have conceded at least three goals in successive Premier League games for the first time um, um, since March, um, while they've won um, just one of their past um, 15 away league matches with five uh, draws and nine defeats. So Fulham certainly better at home than they are away. And that breaking news is flashing again. Chris, have you got another update there? It's Chelsea 2, Man United 2. Desmond! Yeah. Desmond! Desmond! Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. That's an oh, absolute yeah. thriller. Who's got the goals? Um, Ooh. I've just seen Bruno Fernandes pop up as a goal scorer for that one. I, I could be wrong. It, I'm pretty sure it said Bruno, um, Bruno Fernandes. Don't know who scored Man United's first. Um, I assume Palmer scored the penalty for Chelsea. Um, I assume he scored the penalty, but other than that, not not too sure. Yeah, um, yeah. So I've just checked, mate. It's Bruno Fernandez has just equalised. So Garnacho and Bruno yeah. Fernandez score for Man United, and for Chelsea, it was Gallagher and Palmer. Palmer with the pen. Okay, interesting. Uh, goals galore. I, I might have to. Yeah, just. Keep a nice little close eye on this game. Um, see, how it, see how it pans out. Uh, but anyway, um, great stats as always, Keith. Brilliant. One more stat, one more, one more stat oh. there, please. Oh. Um, so there was the stat there about Fulham conceding at least three goals in their successive Premier League games. But Newcastle have also conceded three or more goals in 10 different Premier League games so far this season. Um, and that's that did so just twice in the whole of last season. Um, and uh, Newcastle have last last conceded three or more goals in more different games in a season in 2013-14 when they did so on 11, in 11 games. So um, both Newcastle and Fulham are shipping goals. Oh. <clears throat> Another another spectacle on saturday goals galore as we had last saturday uh but yeah ho hopefully we'll be on the receiving end again but um great stats as always keith superb stuff um great knowledge as always and just to add to that um our main man uh, alexander isaac got seller player of the month um for the month of march and is also in the premier league player of the month um uh, sort of nominations so fingers crossed he gets um he's just deserves and, and, and wins that award as well just to add in the boys have been back in training um great to see lewis hall take part in training there was some rumors that he might have picked up an injury he was kind of 
um, looking towards his groin, although um, Eddie Howe did say it was fatigue. So great to see him back in training. Obviously, the main man, Bruno, um, back in training. The only Bruno back in training. And um, Dan Byrne as well, after a great performance um, against Everton. Obviously, the main man is ice cold. He's always cold, clearly. Um, and uh, uh, our, uh, our Mr. Bow and Arrow guy, uh, Harvey Barnes, um, who is uh, just picking up form nicely just at the right time and and obviously uh, adding to his fitness. So some players back in the mix with regards to that. Um, Emilio, any ones of concern for you um, or ones that might be coming back, ones that might be out on Saturday for Fulham? Um, or, or what, Fulham's perspective or Newcastle plays from a Fulham perspective? Uh, yeah, from a Fulham perspective. Yeah, I think I'm not. I'm not expecting any injuries. I think with Silver made some tactical changes against Forest again to rest players. I think we'll go back to our our, our start, our typical starting eleven. So he'll probably revert back to the two or three changes again. So you'll see, you know, Castagna come back and right back. Who's had he's had a great season. He's kept Kenny Tete out of the team for most of the season. I see Williams starting again on the left. He'll he'll come back in. Um, so yeah, I think we'll. We'll see a couple of changes again. In the middle of the park is my concern for Fulham. You know, who do we put alongside Paulinho? There's a debate whether we put Harrison Reed, Lukic, or Tom Kearney. So it, it you know, I, I suspect we might actually start with Tom Kearney on, 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 on Sunday, on Saturday. Sorry, because Tom will just keep keep possession, not be doesn't give possession away cheaply. I think when the I think the, the middle of the park is going to be key because defensively, you've said it, Keith. Both teams score goals, but are also conceding goals. Like you know, so I think the key thing is. It's winning that midfield battle because I think you know if we can keep possession there, not give ball away cheaply like we did against Forest, then you know we're going to be on you know play with a high press, and I think we could give your defence and your keeper a few problems on Saturday. Mm, definitely, we'll always be mm. always been in in that mix for sure um, with uh, the defensive situation that we've got and with the goalkeeper in mind that we've got as well is always going to be difficult um, um i was just going to come to the tactics board but we have got a super chat so I'll, um drop that onto the screen a massive thank you to tyson um for his um uh, 20 pound donation M much appreciated um so the new F fp rules <coughs> Um, just one second, sorry. Um, uh, to, to come uh, means teams just pay a tax to win. Um, is that all about the money? That's a, that's a great question. Um, is that all about the money? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, but is it all about the money? I know we've touched on it before. Um, to be honest with you, the, we don't know the dynamics of what the penalties will be, but if you can afford to spend £100 million on one play, is it going to be a drop in the ocean to pay it? another one percent of that in a fine because you've reached that's the money you know these these owners are wealthy they want to see their club successful how many clubs actually make a financial profit not many to be honest with you so it's more about pride isn't it at the end of the day so it's but i think to some extent tyson is right you know at the end of the day the owners want to be successful they want their clubs to win but again it's it's going to be boring as you know if you're a newcast fan or a man united fan you know it's or liverpool whatever there's no competition because you know, all you like I said you'll end up having a mini league within the main league and it just you know it's just it's going to bore the living daylights out of everybody so it's I think it's going to be counterproductive I know owners if you've got the money you're entitled to spend it what's a one percent tax on on a hundred million pound players it's a drop in the ocean at the end of the day um so it is you don't but we said it earlier money doesn't guarantee success and you you know Chelsea have spent millions look where they are in the table Man United have spent millions on players last year where are they in the table again it's more than just a financial you know more about money it's about the owner it's about the manager the coaching staff the players it's it's, it's that guarantees you success not money Keith you were kind of nodding ahead there in agreement are you in agreement with what Emilio said with regard to the Tyson's question it's going to be interesting, certainly. Um, it's sort of I heard I heard on one of the other shows earlier today that uh, it's a bit like Premier League footballer sort of getting fined for leaving his car in the wrong space. Really, it doesn't really hurt him really, and I'm just very intrigued to see how this is all going to work out because I think Man City's situation would be just an administration nightmare to try and. With all all of their sort of cases, which which are against them, uh, that that they've had to come up with something, and I think 
in terms of what happened with Fulham, it's not sorry, not Fulham with Everton and with um, Forest. It's I didn't like how what that sort of situation was playing out. To be honest, nobody wants to get to the end of the season as well and have more points deduction when the season ends. So they've got to rethink this really, and maybe this is the way you go. But if people have got the money, it's going to benefit those at the top, isn't it? In the top ones your big six clubs again, I guess, in some ways. Even though Newcastle, this this situation could be better for Newcastle. And us. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed it does benefit us. Um, it's what the owners will be wanting, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm pretty confident if it does go to the Premier League meeting, that it's been rumoured to be in the article around June time at the end of the season, that Newcastle United's owners, uh, Manus Navy, who normally attends those meetings, should be voting in favour for that uh, 100%, if it means that Newcastle are able to kind of flex their financial muscle um, with regards to the summer window, uh, that that is for sure. But um, right, we'll um, we'll come to the taxes board really quickly. Won't spend too long on this because I want to get for a, a few questions that have been um, put towards Emilio, and then get our predictions before we wrap mm. up the show. So, Emilio, just run through um, your starting eleven. What you think? You said they might revert back to what they didn't <coughs> do. What what are you going for when you start starting eleven, mate? Um, obviously, Burton Leno. Um, so again, he was my actually, I voted him as my player of the season last year. The span of Palinia was excellent, you know, got all the tab. I, I downgraded Palinia last season on the basis he got too many yellow cards and missed a few games. But Burton Leno was outstanding and gone. He's, he's not been as good this season, but I think he's second most clean sheets in the Premier League this season. So that's saying a lot. So great yeah. signing. So he'll be obviously, he's been captain recent games as well, by the way, just because. Tom Kenny is traditionally the number of captain. Tim Reen is a backup captain, both on the bench. So Leno's been our captain for the last few games. Um, Castagna will come back on the right of, of defence. You know, he's 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 we got him from Leicester last season. He's been outstanding. You know, he's steady Eddie, if that, if that makes sense. You know, he's not the most spectacular player, but he does the simple things well. He defends calmly, he's very composed, likes to come forward. He's been an asset. Can, to keep Kenny Tete out of the side, that's saying something because Kenny was one of our best players last season. Um, we'll have Anthony Robinson on the left, without you know, without a shadow of a doubt. So that's uh, that's predictable. And then in the middle, we'll have I believe we'll still play Adbayo and Bassi. There's a question mark whether you might see a change there because of the performance against uh, Forest and even against Sheffield United, where we conceded three goals. Yeah. If anything, you might see Tosin Adbayo coming getting dropped, but. I think Silver will keep it as it is. I think because I think go back to your traditional starting eleven. I don't think he'll change that back forward to be other than Castagna coming in. Tim Reed yeah. maybe come in. He, he said the potentially, deal. potentially to stay to steady the ship. Yes, but Tim yeah. hasn't started a few games now, so I worry about you know a Newcastle team who are going to play with a high press. You score lots of goals. I'm not sure it's the right game to bring Tim Reed back in. To be honest with you, I think. Yeah. But uh, I, I would I would keep it. To this this formula, which had been successful up until the the international break, hmm. um, in midfield, um, we'll obviously put Paulinia there, um, and I'll put Tom Kearney in there just to steady the ships. Lukic has done a, a reasonable job. Is it as um, a two? The international break, but uh, he came in done a, against Man United when we won at Old Trafford last month. He was outstanding. You know, he's he got better and better, but. He's been a little bit off colour the last couple of games. So I would probably bring Tom there just to steady the ship and keep possession, play tidily in midfield and don't give the ball away cheaply because that's the, that's going to be the battle. Who wins that midfield battle? Yeah. Um, okay, on the left, I'd bring uh, William back. I think William will start on Saturday. On the left, yeah. Um, on the right, I'll put Alex Iwobi on the right. That's his favourite position. That's where he should be playing. Um you know, the fact that he got taken off after half an hour, I think, won't, you know, plays are plays. The manager, would, like I said earlier, would, would have had a pat on the back and just had a gentle word in the ear. So he'll start. Andres Pereira, you know, be, you know sitting in that central attacking midfield role. Yeah. Again, he's he's got into the Brazilian international stage. He played, he played, he came on a sub in Brazil's last two games. You know, I've been slightly critical of him this season because I don't think he scores enough goals. You know, his assists have been great. You know, as like I said, I think Chris, uh, Keith, you were saying earlier, he's got the most assists behind um, Ward Prowse. 
but mm. I'd like to see him have bag a few more goals um, to make him more rounded. But he will start. He's um, one of Silver's golden boys, and clearly Muniz will have to start on Saturday as well. I don't see a change there. Mm. Okay, mm. Um, team is set. Um, pretty much what I I, I, I thought you, you might go for actually. Um, the only one I wasn't sure about was whether Wilson may may start. Harry Wilson. Um, uh, instead of maybe a Wobi. Um, but no, uh, I, I thought that's um, pretty pretty much to where you would be now. Um, oh, I think Liverpool have just scored uh, as as expected. Um, a McAllister rocket into the top corner. Typical, eh? Typical. Um, yeah. Oh. But, um, Chris, Newcastle United's lineup. Um, be interesting what what you're going for here, fella, because the, there is room for maybe one or two to be moved around slightly. Yeah, um, not going to be an easy one. This, um, so Keith, I will need you to critique. Um, so I think, well, I'm saying I think it will be uh, Martin Bakker in goal. Yeah, um, left centre back, I believe, will be Dan Byrne. Right centre back will be Fabian Shah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, right back, I think, will be Emil Kraft. Yeah. Come on, grab him. Yeah, there we go. Because I think we were, I think we were told, weren't we, the trippy is still not ready. Yeah. Um, and I think left back, judging from the pitchers, would be Lewis Hall. Yeah. So that's that's me back five. Um. I think Bruno will be in the holding position as usual. Yeah. Is it two um, games away now? Two games yeah. away from, uh, from not being able to be banned. So yeah, fingers mm. crossed he sees that through. Sorry, mate. Go on. No, no, no. Um oh, so this is the team I think Eddie Howell starts. So the team I think Eddie Howell start, I think it will be Elliot Anderson on the left of the three. I'd be very disappointed if Elliot Anderson didn't start, actually, because I think he, I think he's been fantastic the last couple of games. Um, so I hope Elliot Anderson starts on the left, and I believe it will be Sean Longstaff starting on the right of the of the three. That's how I think the midfield will be. And then up front, I suppose this is the, this is the difficult one, really. Um, and I say difficult because I'm thinking about the right hand side more than anything. Um, uh, do you know what? I'm going to go with me Gus on this one. I think it will be Harvey Barnes on the left. Okay. Alexander Isak through the middle. There he There he is. And Anthony Gordon on the right. Mm. That's yeah. that's where I don't think he'll move Harvey Barnes um, because Harvey Barnes has just come back on the team, been playing very very well. Um, obviously, we've got Joe Willock there as an option. That was one I considered, um, but I, I do believe Joe Willock. Joe Willock's probably needed a vest. I'd expect him to come on, but I, I think that's how he will start. I mean, you could argue maybe Jacob Murphy on the right, but I just don't see him dropping Harvey Barnes. I think he'll stick with Harvey Barnes for now, um, because like I say, he's been playing well. So I think, I think that is the eleven we'll go with. Interesting. Keith, any other opinions? Agree, disagree? Um, let us know your thoughts. Yeah, as as with most of the season, I would love to argue with Chris Hall. I would love to come up with all these options, but I, unfortunately I've not been... Like a lot, a lot of fans, we've went through this pain of injuries and I just don't have the options here. Certainly back four, I don't think there'll be any changes with that, really. Um agree with Lewis Hall. You've got to go with Lewis Hall after, you know, what happened on Saturday and how well he did on Saturday. If he's fit, you play Lewis Hall. Dan Byrne also seems to be playing well as well. Again, hitting some real good form in that back uh, four, certainly. Um, Anderson, for sure. I think he's probably the one of your strongest, isn't he? Really, he's one of the ones that's in form. Uh, I would certainly favour... Anderson Willick just looks a little bit off at the minute, not quite back to full form yet. So I would still maybe ease Willick back in as maybe a sub or something at some stage of the game. You go with Anderson. Um, and I agree with the points made on um, Harvey Barnes. Certainly uh, he's coming up with the end product. So why change that really at this stage in both games? Um Maybe Murphy comes on as a sub at some some stage. 
for Gordon late on in the game, but for me, that's your strongest line up there. Mm. Yeah, definitely, I think. Um, yeah, the, the only the only question mark I would probably have is whether they go with Murphy instead of Harvey Barnes and mm. put Gordon on the left and yeah. use Harvey Barnes as an impact. And the only reason I say that, because I would love to have Harvey Barnes start, is the fact that he played 90 minutes on Tuesday. And I don't know if Eddie yeah. Howe will be concerned about his workload in, in yeah. giving him too much. Now, obviously, of course, Harvey Barnes will want to play. He'll want to play every minute because he's missed so much football this season. But th that would probably be be my only concern. Not concern, because it's not a concern. Because... Um, That'd be my only sort of change that that could well be made, but or the rest of the team, uh, I think, uh, has to be that for me. As much as we get on, we get on to Longstaff and all the rest of it. Um, Joe Willock needs to earn his place in the team. Um, I really have been disappointed in his last few performances, and we could argue Sean Longstaff performances haven't been great, but. The reason why I say that is Joe Willick plays on the left-hand side of a midfield three. And at the moment, Elliot Anderson is outplaying him easily. So it's almost that those two are tussling out for that position. Um, if you're going on late into the game, I would then take off long stuff for Willock and bring in that, that sort of pace and, and directness later on in the game. Uh, for me, if, if Elliot Anderson's um, fit... He should be playing ninety minutes. Um, he's been back longer than Harvey Barnes, uh, and I I still agree. I I still um I still agree with my own statement. I think I don't I don't think Elliot Anderson looked tired when he came off. I thought he was still chasing down, still pressing, still at it. And I think if Eddie Howe had the chance to go back, I don't think he would have took him off. I really don't think he would have. And I'd hope he's going to make the decision by keeping him on the pitch this time. But the team is as it is um, from from there, and I would definitely go with that um, for for sure if um, that's what Eddie Howe wants to go to. The one thing I'll add to that is that there were sort of rumours that this man Callum Wilson is back in training. Whether that's been confirmed or not, I don't know. But there were some rumours swirling around this afternoon that Callum Wilson was back in training. Um, I don't think he'll be ready for this weekend, but. Um, it would be positive news if he was back in training and ready to play in the next few games because we're going to need all the help we can get, that's for sure. But, um, mm. Mm. Uh, Emilia, where, where, what, what's your style of play? How do you, uh, what, like, uh, how do you think you're going to break Newcastle down at the weekend? I think we're going to do what we did against Tottenham and Brighton, those last two home games. We beat two. You know, top six, top eight teams, three nil, and, and comfortably in both in both instances. So, it's it's you know playing from the off from the first minute. Get at get at the Newcastle defense. I think that defense is vulnerable, just as much as our central defenders have been a little bit off color the last couple of games. I think that defense of yours are there for the taking, in my opinion. So that's why I think the key thing is play with a high press, play with that intensity, and you, know, you get even against Forest. You know, despite the fact they were three nil down in three one, we kept probing we kept pushing we kept playing we kept passing you know the this the, the team is confident you know we, we we our passing game is on its on a, on a good day it's very very good we can match some of these big teams we've been in arsenal at home we won at old trafford we've beaten brighton we've been tottenham so we, we we're giving the so-called higher teams a run for their money this season we're more competitive than we were last year so i think if we if we play with that high press high intent but keep, don't concede early that's my worry i think if we've got it we've got that's why i think putting tom kenny in there will just protect that midfield you know rather sometimes you can get carried pushed forward too much and you forget your basic defensive duties and then you give up you give up a lot of possession and, and then you're on the back foot you know i think that's starting someone's mentioned this is you know you've got still got a lot of injuries but i remember you at st james's parker in december you had a lot of injuries and you still came over the 3-0 win so yeah i don't i'll take that with, with a pinch of salt you know as far as i'm concerned you know this is an even could be an evenly matched game on saturday i think we've got two two good squads of tip players I worry about Gordon. I think Gordon's you know underrated as a neutral. What he offers to to Newcastle, I don't think he gets enough credit. I know he's going to the England reckoning recently, but uh, you know Isaac obviously in hot form for you. But Gordon worries me. I think you know that tussle with Robinson. I think will be interesting um, because be, he's, he's he played well at St James's Park in December, if I recall rightly. He had a good game for you, and uh, he's the one I'm worried. He's probably your danger man, and if he if he gets 
better of Robinson and feeds onto Isaac, then yeah, you've got potentially a chance to break that defence down. But we'll play with a high press, play high intensity, and we'll be looking to get an early goal to steady the ship, so to speak. So that's a key thing. Whereas previously, we're always falling behind against you, and it's always an uphill task. But home form, you know, I'm fairly confident on Saturday. It's going to be interesting. Uh, for, for me, um, Newcastle United, this man has been outstanding. Um, uh, Bruno Demares controls the, the play in midfield, controls the flow uh, in which we attack. Um, obviously, of course, uh, 19 goals this season. Alexander Izak in all competitions. Um, he, he's, a, he's always going to be a threat and um, be interesting to see how he gets on against your centre-backs, whoever they are. You've mentioned Anthony Gordon as well. And if and if he plays Harvey Barnes, because we know what he's like when he gets an opportunity in front of goal, um, he likes to put it in the net. And I think last season he did score for Leicester at your place. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. I, I do think he likes Craven Cottage, which is good news for us. So, so does, does Wilson. And I'm glad Wilson's not sniffing around because he's always got a good record against Fulham as well. So I'm glad he's, he's potentially out of contention or maybe get on the bench if he's fit. Well, I would hope. Uh, I hope that's the case. That would be great news for us, uh, having him on the bench and potentially coming on. But they're the kind of main players there. Anything from you, from you, Chris? Uh, I, I'm I'm interested to see the battle with Tosin and Isaac, if I'm honest, uh, because yeah. that 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 will tell me what kind of player Tosin is and whether he's he's capable of keeping out arguably the the Premier League in form striker. Um, so if he does well up against uh, Isaac. I'll be I'll be majorly impressed. Um, I, <coughs> excuse me. I think as well, it will be interesting to see Elliot Anderson up against Paulinho. Um, Paulinho technically is absolutely brilliant, but I think Anderson's got the pace on him. Uh, can Anderson get in behind Paulinho? Uh, you know, can he get round them? I think that 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 will be a key one for me. Um, and also, as I always say, most weeks, you know, I'm interested to see to see the wing backs. You know, I, I'm, I would hope that Lewis Hall is going to be pushing on, supporting Harvey Barnes or Anthony Gordon, depends on who's going to be on that left. And similar with Emil Kraft. I mean, I had my heart in my mouth a few times when Emil Kraft went forward because he does he does tend to get forward quite a lot, but then tracking back, he, he you know he lacks a little bit in terms of pace. Um, so it's it, it, Sean Longstaff's got an important job um, on the weekend to make sure that he's fully supported if and when Emil Kraft does venture forward. Um, so as long as we play as a unit, as long as we stay tight, uh, I think you know we've we've got a good opportunity to try and get a positive result against Fulham at the weekend. Um, anything from you, Keith, before we move on? Yeah, um, certainly interested to see the likes of um, Paul Yeo. Yeah. Herrera in the midfield. Um, I also think as well, you know, Chris touched on it there about uh, Lewis Hall. Um, I know Alex Awobi as well. He's given Newcastle some problems over re- over previous seasons, certainly when he was at Everton at Goodison Park. And uh, Awobi scored the winner against uh, Man United just the other month as well. So he can be a threat as well and a danger mm-hmm. as well. So that'll be an interesting one to look out for. Yeah. Definitely. Um, they've got some threats. Set pieces for me um going to be a concern because uh, Pereira with his set pieces is very, very good. Um, we're going to need to be able to defend them really well. Um, and you have got some physical players, players that are good in the air, um, whether it's at Munez, whether it's Ade uh, Rabayo, uh, Bassi, uh, Palinia. Uh, Tom Kearney's scored some goals with his head before. So there's 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 players in there that can cause some problems. So we're going to have to be switched on for that. I'm interested in Lewis Hall. Um, if he starts, he, he's been excellent because he's added what Dan Byrne couldn't in his pace, being able to overlap. He's technically very good on the ball and whipping balls into the box. This is where you're going to see that as Liverpool score a third, Gakpo. Um, you know it's easy when Gakpo scores. Um but yeah, um, uh, Lewis Hall running and, and creating opportunities this end could really push Awobi back to, into a defensive role, which takes away from his work here, um, certainly as an attacking player. So it'll be interesting to see how Lewis Hall gets on. Um, it'll be sort of a, another start or back-to-back starts potentially if he does start again at the weekend. Let's see how he gets on with that. Because all Newcastle fans have been saying... Where is Lewis Hall? He needs to be given minutes. This is now his opportunity to show us what he can do. So I'm really, really keen to see how he gets on. Um, this man needs a performance. Longstaff, he scored at Craven Cottage last time in the FA Cup. 
I would take that again. Uh, but he really does need to put a performance in um, because he's getting a lot of um, a lot of stick from from Newcastle United fans, and and rightly so because his performances have not been of the standard uh, that we expect. So um, interesting to see how all of that works out, and of course we always like to see how things work out from what we say on the tactics board to how it actually comes on to the pitch. Um, like last few minutes before we wrap up, um, are there a, a few quick fire questions we can throw at Emilio on all questions in general before we get to those all important predictions? Let's go to Tom Dixon asks you, Emilio, uh, who will Fulham sign in the summer? Have you been linked to anyone? And who do you think is going to leave? I know you mentioned Anthony Robinson. You think it'd be tough to keep hold of him, but is there anybody else who you think you know could be could be on the way out of Fulham? Um, he's probably the one I think with the most likely to go. If we're going to have to balance the books, I think Robinson will probably go. Palinia, I'm still confident he'll stay. I think age is not on his side. He's what 29. I think still got a good job to do at Fulham. While Silver is still there, he'll he'll still be at the club in my opinion. I think it's if Silver goes then. You might see a bit of a mini exodus in terms of who's Fulham will sign. Good question, Tom. I don't. There hasn't really been much speculation, to be honest with you. It's um, I take everything with a pinch of salt. I haven't really even thought about it, to be honest. I'm sorry, I'm being sitting on the fence. I don't really, know. I can't really give you an answer there. We need another striker for sure. Where the Moonies continues to score a goal a game, I still think we need another striker. We need someone to back up. Raúl Jiménez did out, you know, improved till he picked up an injury, a hamstring, uh, six, seven weeks ago. But, you know, he's wrong. He's, what, 32, 33? Rumours that he's going to go back home to South America. So we need a, we need an adequate, strong backup there because I'm not sure if Muniz can sustain this long term. So for me, I've said it for three or four years. Even Mitrovic was here. We didn't have adequate backup strikers. We need we need another striker. That's going to be the highest priority and potentially um, improvement in central midfield. You know, Tom Kenny, Harrison Reed, Lukic, I'm not sure they're... They're top notch, to be honest. I think we need someone just to, you know, someone to work alongside Paulinha and strengthen that mid central midfield. They're my two preferred um, target players. But who are we going to get? You know, sorry, it's going to be minefield out there. Yeah, this is this is an interesting one from Toon Gamer, and he asked you, Emilio, why mm. do you think that Fulham are so hit and miss? Yeah, I think well, I remember Russ was watching, uh, what listening on and watching as well. We said when Silver signed three years ago, we said what you're going to get is some games you win, some games you lose. You're going to have a very and the statistic this is show that we're winning just slightly under the amount of games we're losing. And I think it's just his. He only knows one way of playing. You know, he's not going to sit back defend. He's not going to do what Arteta does now and just put eleven men behind the ball trying to protect a lead or not lose a game. So that's not his philosophy. His philosophy, you saw that through. Three changes after half an hour on Tuesday night. He's only wants to play one style of football, which is attacking. And yeah, there'll be times when some of his substitutions have been a little bit, you know, a little bit strange. When I would have thought protect the lead and defend. No, he's going out to get a second and third goal. So that, and I admire that. You know, we're enjoying a good brand of football. That's the reason why we're so inconsistent because he, he only plays one one way, and he wants to keep attacking, attacking, attacking. Rarely does he end up protecting the defense. When you're with a one goal lead approaching the end of the game, mm -hmm. Ian McKenna asks you, it's a bit of a random one. Uh, do Fulham still have that Jackson statue? <laughs> no, when the new owners uh, came in, that got promptly removed. Right. Okay. This <laughs> might be back so many years ago, and he came all in the mid late nineties. We played Wigan in the third tier, and we beat them to we beat Wigan two 0 and Michael Jackson was there in the stadium with all his um. What is gear, shall we say? So that was all extra gear, photographs on some old camera and what have you. But yeah, it's all the legend uh, all those years ago. Mad, mad. Um, Madame Two Swords or somewhere now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah true, true. <laughs> um, and then Tom Dixon asked to round us up, Emilio, where do you think Fulham will finish and why? I think they'll probably finish where they are. I think it's... I think we've blown it the last two games. I think the Forest and Sheffield United games have only come away with one point. If we have got four or possibly six points out of those games, then, you know, 10th, 11th wasn't have been unreasonable. But I think we've got some tough home games. And they're all, you know, we can hurt Liverpool. We can hurt Man City. We can hurt Newcastle on a Saturday. But we had, we've, we've had chances and we've blown it. So I think if we finish 13th where we are now, still a good season. Mid-table yeah. in the best league in the world. 13th best team in the country, semi-final of a cup. You know, we should be happy about that. Yeah. To be honest with you, I, I, I'll take that. I'll take that very happily. 
because survival is always the minimum a Fulham fan wants to see year on, year out. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's fair, mate. I think that's fair. Well, I've got a few comments I want to run through, and then I've got a question for Pete. Um, so Jordy Tune for Life says, Congratulations, lads, on 9k subs. Thank you very much, Jordy Tune for Life. Um, yeah, we're, um, we're absolutely delighted. Uh, we've we've passed that 9k barrier. Munch says 9k lads, you're flying now. So thank you very much for that, Munch. Uh, and Foxy should be over 10k now, just as for the loaded mags. <laughs> we're on our way, mate. We are on our way. Um, and Daz rightly says, Daz, um, part of the loaded team, roll on June. The fully loaded transfer shows could go super sized, and they will. They absolutely will. I think it's going to be the most exciting summer we've had. Would you? Would you? Would you argue, Pete? I think it probably will be, won't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a big summer for us. We're a bit, a bit of a crossroads after this season. It's either go big or go home. And if these profit and sustainability rules are relaxed slightly, then I think we're going to be going big. So uh, yeah, um, hold on to your hats, folks, because it could be a very interesting ride. Definitely. Now, Pete, here's your question from uh, Steve Reynolds. And Steve Reynolds asked Pete, mm. a serious question. Without injuries, where would you be? Um, honestly, without injuries, we would be fourth or fifth in the table. Um, and, and I'm saying that genuinely. If we'd have not had injuries, I think we'd have been fighting Champions League football. I actually think we would have got Champions League football this season. Um, that's how disappointing and how big the drop off has been with the, the the injuries have caused. Yes, we've had bad performances, but we've had to send players to the to the well week in mm. week out, um, and we were frustrated about it at the time. But when you look back at it, you think, "Wow, that was that was tough," um, and you, you can re reflect on things. And I certainly have, and I think it's been a really difficult season for Newcastle United, which is why I feel confident that with some good signings in the summer. With players fit and available and ready to go again, I do genuinely believe, especially with five places available for Champions League, we will be in that conversation next season. I'm so confident of it. I really am. Yeah. No, I think that's fair, mate. Keith? Oh, oh, well, uh, yeah. Go on, Keith. You go first, mate. You go first. I think, um, in particular, I agree with Pete's comments there. I certainly, one of the things that's noticed has been the drop of points from winning positions this season and Newcastle have dropped 15 points from winning positions this season so I think where they were that would be the 59-60 mark and that would be Newcastle in the top five the question yeah. from me guys is about I think the Eddie Howe situation we talked about it four months ago yeah. where do you stand with him no change from four months ago positive Less positive, you know. You're all very bullish, and he was all he was a man to take you to the next level. Do you still see that the case? Has anything you know changed? What? It's it's interesting you're saying that, Emilio, because we did have a question here from Andy Ford, and he says, "Great news today, RV, the luxury tax." Question is though, if it goes through and PIF mm. decide to spend five hundred million, mm. do they trust Eddie how to spend it? So it's kind of, kind of, kind mm. of the question you're asking, really, Emilio. I mean, for me, um, I think Eddie how. I think Eddie, Eddie Howe, has, he, he's got enough in the bank. He's got enough in the bank to be given the opportunity to at least start the season, particularly if we finish in the European place this season, which I ho hope and believe that we will. Um, but he's going to have to hit the ground running next season. He really, really mm -hmm. does. Because if we do a big spend in the summer, which I'm anticipating that we will, um, and we've got a near full fit squad mm -hmm. to pick from, I think the, the, the expectation levels are going to be up here. Um, I think we're going to have to really start the season well. And I think the owners will probably be saying to Eddie how, you know, let's forget about this season, just go on, focus mm -hmm. on this season. And they're going to want Champions League football. I think there's no doubt the owners will want mm -hmm. Champions League football, particularly if they spend upwards of 150, 200 million this mm -hmm. summer, which is what I think they probably will do. Um, so for me, I think they'll keep hold of them, albeit there's no crash or complete deterioration from where we are now. Um, I think we'll finish sixth or seventh. I think that'll be our final position. And I think Eddie I will take us into next season and he'll be judged probably around the October, November mark. And I think if things aren't going very well at that point, it could be that you know the pressure's ramped up and then we could look to change things in January. But that's just that's just my opinion on it. Pete. 
Um, yeah, but I'm, I, I think they'll they'll trust Eddie Howe to go in with this season and and have another um, another crack at it. Um, I, I'm, I think with the amount of injuries is giving him a bit of license to say, you know what, we'll give you that. The fact that you've not performed at what you were expected to perform, you've had a ton of injuries, the worst in the Premier League by far. Um, like we'll give you the summer, we'll revamp and we'll let you go again with a fully fit squad. Um, I do, I do think there'll be that, that expectation though. Chris already touched on it that if if it's if you don't get sort of finishing in the top five, then then there will be questions asked. And I don't know when Eddie Howe's contract runs out. For some reason, I'm thinking it's the end of next season. I could be wrong. And that may well tie into that conversation anyway. It might be well be that, you know, if you want a new contract, if it is, I could be wrong. If it is, your contract at the end of the season, you need to, if you want to continue, you need to be hitting those targets. And if not, then you will we'll look for another manager. It could well be that's the end of the cycle there. So uh, there is pressure on. There is pressure. There's been pressure this season. There will be even more pressure next season. He has to get it right. He has to make the right signings. Um, if it's 2027, Alan Thompson said, that's fine. It's a little bit longer. And I do know he did get an extension. But even so, if he, if he doesn't... Put Newcastle to where they are and they're right back where they are right now, fighting in around that, that position, I think uh, I, I do think they'll make a decision um, this time next year. Uh, I really do. But um, he'll get this summer. I, I don't think we're going to be spending crazy money, like three, four hundred million. Um, we're, we're not a Man City. But if if the PSR, uh, PSR rules change, I think you could expect Newcastle to spend around 200 uh, with maybe another 50 or so left for maybe January. I, I, I think 250 would be um, a reasonable sum if, if they are relaxed. If they're not, I would expect the same again, maybe in the summer around the 150 mark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Just to, just before we go to you, Keith, I think um, I, I looked online and it said that Eddie Al signed a new long term deal with Newcastle in August 2022. Now, I know Alan said it was 2027. I don't know whether that's confirmed or not. So whether that was a five-year deal, a four-year deal, but I'd say around it's a 26, 27 mark um, where his contract would end. It mm. certainly looks that way anyway. So maybe he's got two, possibly three years left on his deal. But Keith, what what, what are your thoughts on uh, Emilio's question? Just on the uh, Eddie Howe contract, didn't they tie him to a longer contract to sort of like keep him tied to Newcastle and try and hold off sort of England? Because wasn't the question maybe that England could come in for Eddie Howe. But, um, yeah, I agree with a lot of the thoughts that have already been presented on this one. I thought earlier in the season, you know, where there were a few murmurings about Eddie Howe when Newcastle's form was a little bit up and down with the injuries, I thought that he did have enough in the bank and certainly to see this season out and in the next season. My concern would be if there's a, any sort of hangover in form in the next season, like the early part of next season, if Newcastle make a slow and poor start, then I've got concerns for Eddie Howe, you know, um, next season. I, I don't think he would be able to survive next season. Um, it's sort of like, let's say it's a really bad start of the season. It might be middle of the season or latter part of the season. It might be the end. Unfortunately, I don't want it to be the end because I think of everything that he's done and he's done a tremendous job. But I do think it's a pivotal summer this summer. You know, if you think of Keegan in the 90s, different time, different era, he had the two seasons in the Premier League. And then there was that big summer in which Newcastle kicked on, made four big signings and propelled themselves from sixth place where they could have went the other way. They propelled from sixth place to a championship push and finished second. So I think we've really got to kick on this summer with if we're going to sign a few players and I'd like obviously how to still remain at the club. Let's see. I, I hope, I hope he has that good start and we're, we're able to kick on again. Yeah. Nah, fair play. Andrew's confident. <laughs> <laughs> Seven nil. to do that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, Look, we'll get some predictions uh, as we see out the show. Um, uh, I'm going to go Newcastle United, 2-1 win. Uh, I'm always going to back my, my team away from home. Uh, I think it'll be a close game, but I think they'll 
they'll just get the just get the job done. Um, I think it'd be quite even as Amelia you mentioned earlier. But Chris, what are your predictions? I think um I nearly went with two one actually, but I, I think we will right the wrong of Tuesday. I think I think we'll win one nil. Um so I think I think we'll 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 sneak in front and then I think we'll keep it tight at the back and we will come away with a one nil win from Craven Cottage. Take that, mm. I'll take that. Emilio, opposition fan prediction. What are you going for, mate? Yeah, I'm 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 confident for Saturday. I think home form, um, we've done well this season. I think it's a fairly evenly matched teams, to be honest with you. The divide is not as big as it was a six, you know, four or five months ago. I think we've we're closer to Newcastle now than we were back in December. Um, so I I'm predicting a two one win. If I'm really sticking my neck, I could think that we can even win three one, and that's how that's how bullish I am. I'm, I'm being bullish. I wasn't so confident back in December, you know, when we did the show, and uh, you know, I think we've we've we, our home form is good, and I'd like to think we can continue that. But you know, we've, you know, there's still something to fight for. Every place gives us, let's say, two million quid, whatever it is. So two one Fulham, realistically. Oh, interesting, uh, and of course, we can't go anywhere without getting um, double O Stato's prediction. So, what are you going for um, this week what are you going for against Fulham at Craven Cottage? Well, I'm very worried about this fixture. I'm going to add a disclaimer in as well in the <laughs> prediction. Um, I think a sort of the run that we've had at Craven Cottage and against Fulham kind of go on forever. And it's in the Premier League. It's actually been ten seasons since Fulham beat Newcastle at at Craven Cottage. Surprisingly, I know they got the wins in the Champions Championships. Newcastle are very thin on the ground. I can see because of Fulham's great results against Man United, against Arsenal, against Tottenham, against Brighton. I can see a shock result here, but. <laughs> Keep in it going. Keep fairness. going. Keep. Come on, come on. Interested fairness. I'm gonna go up with what people, <laughs> people want. <laughs> That's me. Too. Yep. Two two is the new one one. <laughs> he's gone for the Desmond. Oh god. Uh, he's back on the fence again, Chris. Uh, two two the prediction. Uh, let, let's hope our predictions are right, Chris, uh, and that Newcastle get the point. But uh, there's your predictions, people. Um, and yep, yeah, some positivity from Emilio. Yeah, um, a lot more positive last few months for us. A lot more positive. <laughs> definitely. But look, Emilio, massive, massive thanks for you joining us tonight um, to talk all things Fulham and Newcastle and uh, the PSO, uh, PSR talk as well. Uh, much appreciated. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Super knowledgeable about football in general, which is always a, a great chat with us. But um, just, just tell us where we can find you um, on socials and um, uh, the channel that you are um, that you kind of... Um, support and, and talk yeah, absolutely yeah teddy nello is my prize personal one and cottage talk is you know for anything fulham even if non-fulham fans just come and join us just keep following us we're building our youtube side as well so we haven't got many followers at the moment as much as you guys have got but you know keep keep following us we're a, we're a, we're a proud club we, we you know we're a small club we're people's the club that neutrals like to follow i don't know many people who want fulham to struggle get relegated it's in they're a nice family club i'm not being biased here i'm just saying but honestly from a neutral perspective you know people love fulham so yes yeah, support the club keep up the great show you guys you know you know keep doing all the great work thank you for having me on again keep, i'll keep coming back in year in year out and yeah just a privilege to be part of the show and yeah thanks for all the support keep it up guys and uh people will probably see you on the 12th man very soon i'm sure still gutted last season when fulham were pushing for for europe Dan Potts didn't promote me into the Champions League team. He kept me in the relegation team. So it's like not, not happy about that. But uh something that's a gripe I've got with Potsy. But overall, yeah, great show, guys. Keep it up and yeah, keep up the winning formula and all the best for the rest of the season. Definitely. Cheers, and, uh, for all the Newcastle United fans that are traveling down to Craven Cottage, enjoy it. Be a good um, day out. 
Yeah, good, good doubt. doubt. Always is a good doubt. And, and apparently, if rumours are to be true, it's about to get better because people can go swimming there <laughs> eventually when the, the new stadium is done. They're going to have a, a little pool area. They're going to have the, uh, the area to kind of chill and all the rest of it. Uh, but I, I did get a chance to ask you what you made of all that. But that was uh, when that, that popped up uh, the other week, I was uh, quite surprised uh, that they're going in that direction. But, uh, Let's see what the season ticket prices are look like as well in a few weeks time i'm sure we're going to know what's going on i think they're delaying confirming what it is because they're going to expect i expect them to be quite high probably around the eight ten percent if not higher there's going to be uproar with the fans so i think they're trying they're deliberately delaying tactics say let's get let's get a few more games under our belt before you see fans protesting against um sizable season ticket price increases but yeah i'll still renew you've got to club's your club it's part of your blood and you sacrifice a few beers and coffees here and there. Football comes first. R- rooftop pool parties at a football stadium. Who would have thought it? Eh? Exactly. Who would, have, who would have thought it? But uh, it's happening at Funnel. So uh, oh. be interesting. Uh, massive thanks to Double O Stato. Uh, thank you for all your uh, stats and support and, and just general knowledge. Um, it's always good to have you critique uh, everything that, that me and Chris do uh, on the show. And uh, of course, mm. the main man, Chris, spot on as always. Uh, in the chat, on the questions, on the button. And thank you, everyone in the chat, uh, for your questions, your comments, your chat. The community is outstanding. It always is. Just make sure on the way out that you click that like button. Let's get that up. Um, We'd have had hundreds in the chat over the course of the um, hour and 40, drifting in and out. So thank you for watching the the show. Um, And if you're new, if you're a Fulham fan, and you like what you've seen and what you've heard tonight, click the subscribe button and come and join um, the Loaded family, that's for sure. Just a few quick shout-outs before we head off. Massive thanks to Russ and the team at the Radiator Shed. Thank you very, very much for your support. Uh, great to meet you last weekend um, and with the Loaded lads to be a part of it. And, of course, um, all the Radiator designs are manufactured in Italy. Aluminium rads are environmentally friendly and are perfect for heat source pumps. And they offer a home survey service and will install if required um and just check out a couple there for sure massive thanks to uh, bathroom De- designs h2o thank you for your support um and thank you for providing quality bathrooms and there's more pictures and new uh, designs that we haven't got up yet and we will have very very soon want to become a member click that blue button just there and add yourself to the loaded ultras and um, you can only do it on a laptop not on mobile phone just to give you an idea and just to go as we go out man united have gone three two up um uh, so yeah um it's all changed and uh chelsea is still in the mud which is a, a, a good thing <laughs> <laughs> <That's really laughs> we can still leapfrog and still be the best team in west london that's a that's a, that's the target for this season um, there you go there you go uh you heard it here first um but guys we are are out um fingers crossed for three points at the weekend but we will be back uh with a match reaction more content next week so keep an eye on all things loaded mag and ufc until then we do love playing away chris give us those words how do you like that